The next video in building a profitable web design business is about contracts and project structure. In other words, what we're trying to do is, it's, it's all about control. We're actually trying to keep the upper hand. We're trying to keep a, an element of control within projects with, with any client. And really, if there's one theme to this particular video, it's going to be that contracts are very important and to think about why we do or don't use contracts. So first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a bunch of good reasons, I hope, of why you should use contracts. Then we might look at why we don't use contracts. And I have to tell you guys that the lessons in this video are lessons that I have learned through painful experience. I'm not going to give you all the examples, but just take my word for it. So why should we use contracts? Okay, there's lots of benefits. One of the main ones is it's actually insurance. It's minimizing your risk so that it, it prevents you from not getting paid. It prevents you from having to do a lot more work than you expected to do. Right, insurance is there where you invest a little bit in order to save yourself nothing for the majority of the time, we hope. But in the case of catastrophic disaster, in the case of you have a car accident or your house gets burgled or whatever, insurance is there to spread that risk out. So what we're doing is we are investing a little bit of time for at the start of each project to get a, a contract down, which then becomes the basis of our agreement with our client. And most of the time, hopefully, you shouldn't have to rely on it too much. But sometimes it could help you from avoid a worst case scenario. So number one, minimizing risk. A contract also improves transparency in a project. It improves communication and makes project management a lot easier down the line. Bottom line is what we're doing is we're being completely open. We're being transparent. We are saying this is what we're going to do. This is what we're not going to do. This is who's responsible. And when you get all those things down and they are agreed, then everybody knows where they stand. Everybody knows what's expected of them. And everybody knows what's going to happen if they do or do not do certain things. A contract, importantly, also establishes your authority. And we're going to look at that in um, a little bit later. And it also clarifies the rules of the game, bottom line. Okay, And another interesting outcome of going through this process is it can actually increase the client's confidence in you as well because it establishes you as, as we said as an authority as a professional you have are saying this is these are the rules under which I will participate in this this is what I am promising to you and this is what I want from you right when you do that you then have control and power in the relationship. We're not saying you have absolute power and absolute control. This isn't just about dominating your client. This is about standing tall and saying, this is the agreement that we have entered into. And it's not, importantly, it's not giving all the power over to the client. So why don't we use contracts? Now, I've done a lot of projects where I've just either not had a contract in place at all or I've missed out, I've skipped over this step, I've done it too quickly and I've left out some very important things. I'm going to, hopefully I'm going to give you all of those important points that you've got to cover in future. Okay, then that's later on. So, why we don't use contracts? I believe that the most common reason why we don't use contracts is it's a reflection of low self-worth, right? We simply don't think that we have enough power in order to be able to insist that the client sign a contract. Either that or it's just laziness, which is <laughs> quite often in, 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 my, in my case. But this, this reason is false. Well, actually, it's true unless you choose it to be false. Right? This is the thing about self-worth. You are worth what you believe you're worth. Okay, 
it's it starts from the inside it comes from the inside if you wait for your clients to give you respect before you believe that you deserve respect you'll be waiting a long time and you'll be surprised when it happens self-worth self-respect starts with you right, so if you choose that you are worth it to quote the adverts right then you're worth it if you go out into the world thinking I'm not worth it I'm not worth it you're not worth it you, it starts with the being you can see that kind of theme coming through in, in these videos really so you choose who you are are you worth it or are you not worth it if you respect your talents if you respect your time and if you respect your clients you will use contracts if you don't there's no need to use contracts right if you just want to let the client have all the power and all the control because guys they're the ones signing the checks then go ahead don't have a contract have some emails and vague promises and get yourself kicked all over the park right so what are you going to choose it's up to you to choose who's in charge of this relationship is it going to be you or is it going to be them who makes the rules of the game if there is no contract in place the one who's in charge is the one who controls the money that is the client you are a service provider they are paying you if you don't agree exactly what you are and are not going to do they are in control because they're controlling the money if there is a contract you can negotiate from a position of authority and I really want you to think of it like this that clients are like kids they actually like and respect having clear boundaries in place kids actually get quite uncertain and they're, they're unhappy when they don't know the rules that they're expected to follow they love knowing what they are supposed to do and what they're not meant to do right it's like a game of soccer football you've got the the pitch and on the pitch there are certain rules that apply if the ball stays in play then you can you've got a certain element of freedom if the ball goes over those lines it's out the whistle blows the game stops you start again okay having a contract in place should give your client a sense of security and should also build their respect in you that they are dealing with somebody who respects themselves when you are dealing with somebody who respects himself or herself you will respect them more so I think I've got the point across really that why contracts are important so let's go through a list of short list of recommendations number one always have a contract even if it's for the smallest thing it shouldn't take you long if you get down your template a proposal or contract which for me is the same thing if it, my client signs a proposal that's the contract they're signing with me right um, if you get that down it shouldn't take you very long to adapt it to each particular project but it's time well spent that is your insurance premium that time that you put in every time okay never work for free we've covered this already so I just just want to underline it again your contract will say this is what I'm gonna do this is what it's worth if you work for free you are saying my time is worth zero this is important you want to minimize your risk exposure now when in in the proposals and contracts that I have sent to clients in the past I'm trying to minimize that exposure to no more than 10% of the overall project value so if a project is a design and build project and it's for $10,000 then I never want to have done more than 10% without having been paid for that 10% if you get my point this is about putting you in a position of some control but not not too much control as we've said so my typical project structure was always 30% up front now that is the price of entry for the client you want to work with me you're going to pay 30% of my quote up front in order as as I used to put it to secure studio time then there'd generally be 30% that's due upon design sign off 30% due immediately prior to and signifying permission to go live 
And then the 10% at the end signifies everything is done, everything is wrapped up, the project is complete and closed. Okay, so all these things signify something. That first payment signifies I am engaging you. The, se the second one is that the design is approved. And the third one is, yes, I give you my, my permission to go live. And it's really good to have these hard associations between payments and what they represent. Okay? Do you approve the design? If you approve the design, you make payment number two. If you don't approve the design, we'll keep going backward and forward. Okay? Now, obviously, these, this, these proportions may vary by the type of project. You may need many more kind of payment points, or you may need fewer. It depends. But I would advise that you, in your contracts, that you build them so that you have never done more than 10% of the work you're going to do without having been paid for that work. So, as I've been hinting at, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to strike a kind of balance. And I'll explain it. If you get paid too late, right? If, if you have a contract that says, um, pay me nothing now, and when I have delivered your website and it's live, you pay me 100%, there's, no, there's very little incentive there for you. The carrot is a long way away on the end of a very long stick, right? The, the reward for you is too far removed from the work that you're expected to do. On the flip side of that, also getting paid too early can crush your motivation as well. If a client pays you 80% of the project right now, and then 20%, which could be months down the line, where's your motivation to do that, that work that's required in the middle? Okay, so what we're saying is that the payment structure should match the work that is needs to be done, the thought that needs to be done, the hours that need to be put in pretty closely. But if there is a slight tilt, it could be in the client's favor, but by no more than 10%, if you get my meaning. Okay. So keep this in your mind. You should never be too far into the red and you should never be too far into the black. Okay, so you should never have too much of the client's money without having done the work. You should never also, you shouldn't be doing too much work without being paid for it as well. Now, I have to say, in this video, obviously, I can't give you the perfect project structure because I don't know what kind of projects you're doing, what kind of work you're doing, what kind of clients you're doing them for, how much you're charging those clients. And also, I can't give you every clause that you may or may not want to put into your own proposals and your own contracts but all i can do really is to give you the best guidelines that i can give you for doing this so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a bunch of questions and any time and any time that you are writing a proposal or a contract i suggest to you that you run through all of these questions and in fact, my, my best advice I can give is probably to write a, a default template contract from which you can then remove pieces if you need to. But make sure that all these questions are in there. Keep it as a, as a template, as a blank document that you then make a copy of and you know, make the actual instance of for each, each uh, project. So here's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at goals we you know what what are the objectives of the project what are you agreeing to we can look at, at timing remuneration and the payment schedule deliverables that's in what are you actually promising to give the client ownership who owns stuff costs this is talking about external costs and who's responsible roles and responsibilities and then a couple of kind of exceptions. One is non-cooperation on the client's part. The other one is the situation where the client doesn't take your advice. Then finally cancellation and potentially penalties. And I'm going to give you one rule of thumb that you can apply to all of these, which is if in doubt, under promise. Under promising gives you room to over deliver. 
And it's always better to under-promise and over-deliver than to over-promise and under-deliver. And if you are a professional and you respect the work that you do and you want the client to respect the work that you do, you will not over-promise. You will be on the conservative side where possible. So let's start with goals. And really, guys, this is quite straightforward stuff. You know, what we're trying to do here is just we're trying to give you a, a complete picture so that your proposals, your contracts should be watertight. So first of all, and this is really important, particularly in proposals, you need to show that you understand the client's real business goals. And if you followed the steps in the previous videos, you will do that. You'll have asked all the best questions. You'll know what, what it is they are really trying to achieve. And the contract or proposal should say, this is what we're going to do, or this is what we're going to try and do. Right? Because there's a distinction between saying this is our aim or this is what we're promising. So what promises are you making, if any? Don't feel that you need to make guarantees and promises if you can't do that. Is there a time scale for reaching the goals? Yeah, if you say that this website is going to generate so many leads or so much in sales or so much traffic, by what point is it going to do that? What measure will you use for business goals? So, for example, I've got one client who did uh, their website, I think, generated 210 sales over a six-month period, and then I promised to increase that by 83 over the f subsequent six months. And that that goal is going to be measured in Google Analytics, right? So we're saying this is the number. If they hit 293 sales in this half of a year, then it'll be a success. If it's 292, it will not have been a success. And that that will be measured in analytics. Your contract should say if the goals are not met, what then? Right? Good, important questions for you to ask. And of course... As with all of these, if in doubt, under promise, which gives you room to over deliver. Consider timing. What milestones are you aiming for and when should they occur? Do you promise or guarantee to meet those timing milestones? Also consider what actions may be necessary on the client's part for your promises or guarantee to hold true. You can't promise to deliver a website if the client never signs off the design, for example. So you may want to give them a time limit for doing that. So as I've just said, where there are actions for the client to do, how soon do those actions need to be completed? And finally, in the case of proposals, so this is when we're talking about the, the, the kickoff of the project, by what date do you need that agreement? In, in other words, you want a wet signature? As, as we call it, so somebody actually signed something and faxed it through, and payments generally, which I very, very much recommend. You really don't want to be starting work without the client having handed over some money. Okay, By what date do you need that to have happened in order to be able to say, this is the schedule? You know, If you've got a, a two-week holiday planned in the summer, and the, the client sits on the, your proposal for several weeks, so you know, that may then affect your ability to deliver on schedule. So consider that. Remuneration and payment schedule, very important. So your proposal or contract should say what payments will be due at what points. If payments are not made, what consequences will there be? And one of those consequences could be that you walk away. Right? Never be afraid to threaten to walk away from a project and never be afraid to walk away from a project if a client is not fulfilling their obligations. Are payments dependent on certain goals being met? If so, what are the terms of that? What if a goal is nearly met or partly met? And again, just always be thinking, minimize your exposure to, I would recommend 10% of the total project value. Deliverables means what are you actually going to hand over? What assets will the client actually get? Now, this may be different to what you do. And I would suggest that you 
kind of try and divorce these in your mind and divorce these on paper in your in your contracts so it really doesn't matter what you do I, I think that the deliverables are much more important for example if you say that you you know the client will get this that then gives you the ability to draft in help from elsewhere you could subcontract part of the work if you, if you want to as long as you deliver what you promise to deliver so part of this is also trying to get out of that mindset of delivering time right what we are really about is delivering results delivering business value so describe every deliverable so some examples might be designs or documents or the final working website okay ownership is associated with deliverables at each point in the project your contract should say who owns what assets if you send a homepage design to the client who owns that design important question because the client then may say actually we're going to back off now but I'm going to take this design I'm going to give it to a cheaper designer or an in-house designer that we've hired for a few weeks get them to build it okay so you need to think about that what could happen at each point and it's it's part of the way that a professional works is to respect themselves respect their work so much that they are covering their own ass okay so if you're going to send a design to a client who owns the design your contract must state that categorically okay so for going back to the previous example my 30 30 30 10 setup this is for a design and build website design and build those contracts specify that the client only owns the creative after they've paid that second 30 percent first 30 percent is their upfront that's that's their kickoff that's their skin in the game all right that's their seat at the table the second 30 percent means i approve the design of this site the moment that money hits my bank account or paypal they then own all of the designs that I've sent them including any des designs that they've rejected right but they then own that and the ownership is very clear as you'll see I'm actually going to give you a copy of my default proposal and I would suggest that you you know chop bits out of that and add your own bits in um, according to what's going to be important and relevant to you so that payment, as I said, signifies acceptance of the design and sign off of it and also taking of ownership of, of those, um, those assets. Costs means what third party costs there may be in order to deliver the project. So you know, the client's going to pay you X amount. There will be other costs to consider. Now, the, does that come out of your budget? Does that come out of your X amount? Or is the client liable for it? Right? Any costs each time, think what costs could there be and who's going to pay it? For example, pay per click fees. If a client's going to agree to pay you $5,000 for a pay per click campaign, are they expecting the, 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 the payments to Google or Facebook or whatever to come out of that $5,000? Just make absolutely sure it's clear. And make sure that they know it and you know it. Hosting fees, buying uh, commercial plugins or other third party tools. Yeah, really think what could be incurred in this and leave a clause in your project to say if there are other uh, third party tools that I'm not going to build that we need to buy in, who's going to buy it? So, who's liable to pay any of those costs? Also consider if the client is liable, if your contract says the client is liable to pay the cost for the hosting or whatever, and they don't pay it, you know, they don't set up the hosting account, they don't pay for the AdWords budget, right? What could the consequences be? So this isn't about being mean. This is about being transparent and open and utterly clear so that everybody knows where they stand. Roles and responsibilities. I have a whole page in my proposals, which has got for a, a normal website designer build uh, project, every single little role that there could be. Now, in some of these I say not applicable. Some of these I say it's my responsibility. Some of them I say it's the client's. Sometimes it's both. But I go through each one of those and you'll see that in the uh, template proposal. 
So identify every possible responsibility in the project and specify who is responsible for each and every one. And I'll give you that standard list in my template. So here's a, a kind of possible exception that could happen. It's something that you need to cover out, which is non-cooperation. In other words, if there are actions that the client is going to have to do in order for the project to be a success, okay, you need to list them in your proposal. If the client then is unresponsive or fails in their responsibility, what could be the consequences? Right? So make sure that is either covered in the, in the specific cases or that you have a clause that covers them in the general cases. If I send you an email and specify that this is required by a certain date, um, you must agree to fulfill whatever you have to do in order for the project to the, the contract to be upheld. Here's another variant on that, which is not taking your advice. And this is actually a fairly common scenario. And this is a question that comes up again and again and again in the Alliance forums in particular, and it never goes away. It's a perennial problem. Right? The problem is I've said to the client, that would be a stupid idea. I would do this. The client says, no, I want to go with that. Okay. You say to the client, I think it's a stupid idea. I think it will cost you money. I don't think it'll work. Right? That's me as an expert speaking. The client says, no, I want to do that. Okay. So what do you do? So here's our general response. And I would advise that you put something like this into each of your proposals. So here's the general reaction a response that, that we give to that. So we say, you promise to give your best advice and recommendations to the client. If the client should ignore your advice, you will repeat that advice in writing and remind the client that they have the ultimate decision-making authority. However, if they choose to ignore your advice, that any guarantees may be invalidated. Now you may need to have that in your contract up front in order to be able to pull that out of the bag later on. So what this is saying is, look, Mr. Client, you're, the, you're paying the bill, okay, eventually, but if we say that having this bouncing, flashing thing on the side of your website is a bad idea, or, or you know, we think you shouldn't have the, the slider going across showing this, this, whatever, and, uh, and I say, no, you mustn't do it that way, you should do it this way, and you insist on doing it your way, that's fine, I will implement it. However, any guarantee or promise about performance of the website may then be null and void if we do that. And that, I think, is possibly the, the ideal, striking the ideal balance there. So getting towards the end then, cancellation. Sometimes relationships don't work, right? Sometimes mummy and daddy are going to fight. So consider who has the right to pull out and at what point can they pull out? This is like your prenuptial agreement, okay? You should have the right to be able to withdraw if a, a contract is not, if a project is not working, right? Um, so consider if the client should cancel at any particular point, right, at which phase of the project, would any payments still be due? Now, if you have balanced your payment schedule with the work that's going to be necessary, you shouldn't really fall into this situation. If the client, if you've sent some designs to the client and they pull out, okay, you've got your initial 30%. This is back to my original model, my 30, 30, 30, 10, right? So they put, until they pay the 30%, you don't do any work, the first 30%, right? When they pay that 30%, you then start the design. You send them designs. And they may then at some point withdraw. If they withdraw, you keep the first 30%. But they don't get to keep the designs, right? And you have got a legal document to prove that. If they pay the next 30%, they get the designs and you proceed to build the, the website, right? They may pull out at that point. At that point, all they own is the designs. They don't own the, own the build. And it's also helpful if you build the website on your own server rather than theirs. Well, that's a getting to specifics. So if the client should cancel, what payments will still be due? If you cancel at any point, what should your commitments be? 
So for each phase of your project, just ask yourself these questions. And it may also be worthwhile considering potential penalties. If, and I'll just mention this in the, in the general case, if either you or the client should fail in some important responsibility, what penalties could become due? Now this is really playing hardball now. If you've got a really important guarantee and you are making a big promise to a client in return for big fees, right? We don't make big promises in return for small fees, right? If you're going to make, if you're going to play a big game and make a big promise, maybe back it up with a big penalty. I will give you back 110% of the fee if I fail to deliver, for example. And by the same token, it is showing utmost respect of yourself and your time and your skills and your talents to say to a client, if you don't do this by this time, then I can't fulfill on this and you will then be due to pay me a financial penalty of some kind. Right? That is really pushing it to the limit. So just to summarize them, if you don't have a contract, you're not in control. Professionals put themselves in positions where they are in control. Amateurs do not do that. Amateurs are not in control. Choose who you want to be. Choose who you are to your clients and then respect that choice. Say, I am, I am a professional. I have valuable, important skills. My time is worth something. And my contracts are going to reflect that reality. And then finally, be it. All right? Be who you want to be. Because nobody else is going to give you, award you that position. It starts and ends with you. If you be it, your clients will see it. And they will respond in the right way. If you lay on your back, for the, let the client tickle your belly then you know they can do whatever they want so be it be it day in day out on every project and with every client and that guys is the best advice that i can give you for projects and for uh, your and that guys is the best advice that i can give you for constructing your proposals your contracts and your projects <music>